we are still trying to plead with them to be sensible, to be humane, and to release those hostages that are in there. After the deadline, we will kill everybody here, all the hostages. For the first time ever, there's the chance to go behind the cloak of secrecy, that is, the SAS. SAS, the complete soldier's story, which includes unseen footage and interviews. Experience the grueling training. Is he gonna skew? He don't even know here! The incredible action. The amazing speed and the unbelievable strength of the greatest fighting force in history. Also available from the explosive and compelling TV series are a further four videos. They always say, luck shines on the brave. These are the men who risk everything. When you join a force like the SVS, you know that you'll be used for the best jobs. Get the SAS's side of the story. Get the videos and get viewing. In January 91, the Iraqis began launching Scud missiles on Israel. If Israel had retaliated, it would have been politically impossible for the coalition Arab forces to remain in the war. The Western alliance against Iraq would have disintegrated. The SAS were tasked to go deep behind enemy lines, locate the Scuds, and take them out. Failure might have given victory to Saddam Hussein. They would cross the border in strength, fully armed, fully tooled up, maximum ammunition. They would then search until they located a mobile scud position. They would drive in, guns blazing, destroy it, drive off into the night. This film is about two successful missions deep behind enemy lines. Young Trooper Matt's story. The first mission is about the first shot fired in anger on the ground in the Gulf War. The first kill. White-eyed, up close. Initially, they talked about us doing some form of hostage release because of all the uh, hostages that have been taken in Kuwait and then moved up towards Baghdad. And then taskings changed throughout as the theatre actually built up. They started looking at us going into Western Iraq, deep behind enemy lines, and doing some form of search and destroy. Basically, as a disruption force to draw the attention away from Kuwait. There was very limited information on the enemy that was going to bump into, even though they said that it could be substantial. We just went out there, basically, and just see who we'd come across. We knew that we were better than anybody that we were going to come across. So I think uh, that's where our uh, professionalism then clicked in. It was a, a mixture of terrains. I don't think, I can't ever remember coming across any sort of desert environment like sand, like you saw on the, uh, people saw on the TVs. It was very, very rugged terrain. We'd been driving all night at that stage. We'd been across the border in the region of about four to five days. 
We'd been in, in as layout point as LUP for most of the day. And what we tried to do is get into dead ground, into a depression in the ground if we could, um, to keep concealed, especially at a great distance. We put sentries out upon the high ground, which could then identify anything coming towards us, and cammed the vehicles up, put big cam nets over the vehicles, and basically just got on with administration, cleaning weapons, sorting yourselves out, getting some food down here, uh, and then get, uh, eventually getting some sleep. The weather was, in everybody's opinion, horrific. You know, the guys that have been to Norway said that they'd never, ever been so cold. We didn't have the equipment and the clothing to, to keep us warm. I started to have a, a, a lot of uh, cold uh, injuries to my fingers um, because the gloves that we, were, we, we had weren't uh, good enough. They were only uh, very thin leather gloves uh, and y your hands became very, very hard and very cold. As the time progressed, my finger, the skin around my fingernails started to crack um, on, on all my fingers and, and both thumbs, uh, which caused a lot of pain, um, especially as you, it got colder in the night. Um, so what we were having to do was wrap socks around, cut holes in socks and put socks over his hands. Because it was that cold, you were gritting your teeth a lot more. And I, I cracked a, 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 quite a few of my teeth at the back of my mouth um, because of just pure grit in my teeth. Clothing was initially uh, very limited. We, we was under the impression and as intelligence had stated that we was, um, we was, it was quite warm out there. And we, most of us went out with jungle combats or desert combats at the time, um, which turned out to be quite poor. Um, and as normal SAS smocks, which uh, are slightly wind resistant, but in the temperatures that we were going to come across, uh, they weren't that good. At about three o'clock that afternoon, one of the sentries that was on high ground pointed across to uh, down the, the wadi. And there was a vehicle coming towards us, a small jeep type vehicle. And all of a sudden it just drove straight towards us and we didn't know who the hell it was. We obviously knew it was Iraqi. Um, so, you know, you can only take it that it, it's obviously enemy. Because the immediate shock that, Jesus, there's a, there's a vehicle coming towards us, um, it, it did cause a bit of a, an initial flap once we identified who they were. Some fuck is coming! drove up right up towards our vehicle and stopped within about 30 metres of it. The driver got out, the commander got out and two guys stayed in the back and we was all under the cam net, getting ready to let these guys have it. 
and uh, as he came towards us, I thought, Jesus, I'm going to kill this bloke. And, um, you know, the first kill. And uh, as he came towards us, one of our guys walked out with his weapon behind his back. Our lad lifted his weapon up. At that point, he had a stoppage. But at the exact same point, I dropped the guy. This all happened in an instance, but it seemed to take a great deal of time. Keep him down! Fast as can hit! Shmag him now! Shmag him! At the same time, and I'm talking of literally over seconds, I got up with another guy and started moving towards the vehicle. As we got there, one lad was pulling the body out of the back and there was a big jet of blood just spurted out, which stuck in my mind, you know, because that's the graphic detail of it. Shmag him up. Get him over to the vehicle, quick as you can. Move it! Okay, get back and check the vehicle. Check the guy, get ready now. The guy died very, very quickly. Oh. Oh. Yeah. The other Iraqi was yeah. massively traumatised. Yeah. He, he was in great yeah. shock yeah. because yeah. all of a sudden he had he was on a, a normal yeah. reconnaissance yeah. Yeah. for the area. Yeah. And um, yeah. next thing he yeah. knows, everybody yeah. that's yeah. with him has been killed. Okay, the money. the money. They were the uh, reconnaissance group, the command group for a very large artillery division. And the information that they had on them gave the Allies a massive amount of information of what was going on in Iraq, basically. We were told afterwards when we eventually got back across the border, there was somewhere in the region of 30 odd thousand troops coming into our immediate area where we was. And at, at that point, we was actually surrounded by them already. The immediate shock of everything died down very, very quickly. We realised we'd got three bodies, we'd got a prisoner of war, we'd got a vehicle. Deniable operation, what the hell do we do with it? Initially we was going to bury the bodies there and then, but it would have been ludicrous because their forces would have come to that location anyway. And seen them, because we could only dig very shallow graves. So. Uh, we got the prisoner, threw him on the MSV, and the bodies, we threw them back in their own vehicle. And one of our lads volunteered to drive the vehicle. Uh, and he had an ulterior motive in doing so because uh, this was a co covered vehicle, it had a roof, but it also had a, a, a eater. And the intention was that we would take the vehicle with us. We then bugged out, as we call it, and moved away from the location but heading the opposite direction to what they came from. I think we were in the region of about 75 to maybe 100 miles behind enemy lines at this stage. Throughout that night was quite a nightmare because uh, we were surrounded by a massive force uh, and the intention was that an helicopter would come in that night, take the bodies, the vehicle and the prisoner of war. Uh, at that stage when we stopped and the guy got out of the vehicle that had been driving the, uh, the bodies around all night. He, he, uh, he smelt quite badly because obviously these bodies were starting to uh, decompose in the back of the vehicle, but he was totally unaware of that because he'd been nice and warm all night in his, uh, in his little vehicle, uh, which was uh, slightly amusing, and it, you know, even though it was horrific what, what had happened. Uh, but it brought, you know, brought a few smiles on, the, on people's faces that... He was nice and warm, but he stunk to high heaven. The helicopter came in um, when it was dark, and uh, they would fly at ultra low level, literally 10 or 15 feet off the ground. The pilots were incredibly good uh, at night, um, on night goggles. We got the vehicle ready with the bodies in the, in the vehicle, ready to push on board the aircraft. The helicopter landed, massive amount of noise, Anyway, the RAF loadmaster decided that that vehicle wasn't going anywhere near the helicopter. So we was immediately uh, in a predicament, what the hell do we do with it? The prisoner went on the aircraft 
um, a bit of commotion and the aircraft took off. We're still stuck with a, an Iraqi vehicle with three dead bodies in it. What do we do? Our fears uh, were definitely the fact that if we keep taking these around with us and we do get captured, they're going to look at it and say, well, these people, these European soldiers have got three of our uh, men in, dead in, the, in a vehicle and they, will, they would probably uh, kill us. Um, so we had to dispose of the bodies. There was a, a, a gully and we just dug it out even more in the space of about half hour. And uh, we literally just threw the vehicle into the pit, obviously with the bodies inside, and uh, shoved two uh, anti-tank mines that we had, uh, that we carried around with us, uh, which are massive, big uh, mines. Shoved them under the vehicle, poured the rest of the kerosene and the uh, diesel fuel that we weren't using uh, around the vehicle, shoved a, uh, a big can of uh, petrol inside the vehicle uh, with the bodies and put a timer on the, uh, on the devices, on the uh, mines, uh, set the timer to go off. Um, I think it was around about five o'clock the following morning, uh, or that morning, I should say, and uh, which would give, give us, you know, five or six hours to get away, as far away from it as possible. And that's exactly what happened. So lo and behold, uh, we drove all night uh, to, to find another location. And uh, literally at f about five o'clock that morning, we didn't hear it, but we could see a flash on the horizon as this thing had gone up and uh, hopefully incinerated and uh, disposed of the evidence and the bodies that were there. Um, and the flash died down as it was just starting to come uh, daylight. Um, that was that. Victor 2 an Iraqi military installation responsible for communications and the guiding of mobile scuds. Heavily defended. A classic hit and run night raid that echoes the SES days of World War II. We used to get sit reps every night from headquarters telling us what was going on. Um, an intelligence report came in that there's a, a big microwave installation to our north which they wanted us to go and recce it with the intention of destroying it. Basically what we had was uh, a building, a square building with a massive uh, antenna in it with microwave dishes all around it and it was surrounded by a number of different vehicles, buildings, port cabins and the such like. We were tasked basically to go in into the installation with a, a big bag of explosives, which would be on a safety fuse, which would give us in the region of about a minute and a half to get back out. The theory was that we might be fighting as way in and out because we didn't know how many troops would be in there. Uh, but that's how we was gonna work it. Peace through superior firepower, that's what, how we was gonna do it. those two vehicles that was very close to the objective, two big uh, vehicles, one of them with a, what looked like a water bowser or a fuel bowser. I was tasked to go and ID that one and just watch that. Everything was very, very quiet. You know, you could literally hear a pin drop.
never thought that we would fail in his mission. As for thinking about not coming back, yeah, it entered my mind every night, and it normally entered my mind just before we started off. And uh, at that point, I would always think, well, is this going to be the night? You know, and uh, I'd say little things to myself and occasionally off offer myself a little prayer that everything would be all right for not just myself, but for all the boys. the contact and the old place erupted. taking some quite a bit of incoming but there was a massive amount of fire coming from our right trace around were then starting to come very close and it, it's a, a very weird feeling when you've got these what i call red hornets flying at you um, and they're hitting the ground all around you and bursting all over the place <laughs> very very lucky the advantage that we had is that we had the bottle to go and do it and the old, uh, you know the cliche is and it is very uh, it may sound very silly who dares wins but at the end of the day we did have that um, going for us we knew what we were doing they didn't know who the hell we were and we went in there and achieved his mission and we didn't lose anybody in doing so the border uh, a few weeks later I uh, a few of us approached the intelligence guys basically to start doing some finger poking uh, and find out what had actually gone on they informed us that um, the there were in, in excess of between 250 to 300 uh, enemy troops on that one location and uh, we realised then that we was, uh, we'd been up against a far, far bigger force, but in no way superior. Every mobile column that set off to carry out a mission achieved their aim 100% successfully. The Iraqis were forced to move their scuds out of range of Israel. Those that remained were destroyed on the ground. General Schwarzkopf um, decided he'd pay us a visit and he, he came and visited our squadron. His personal jet came in and he, he came up and he, he shook hands with every man in the squadron and he gave us a speech and the speech was by far one of the most exhilarating speeches I've ever heard in my life. To hear this man sing our praises and this is when we realised the impact that we'd had actually over there. The major impact arose when he started mentioning uh, about the Israelis 
himself saying that they'd gone to speak to the Israelis about not entering the war because of the threat of losing the, the Allies. And he, he emphasised the point that it wasn't until he mentioned that he had special forces in behind enemy lines that the Israelis then started to back down. But it wasn't until the Israelis asked which special forces were, were there and uh, he said, we've got British SAS in uh, behind enemy lines, that they then did actually back down. And when he say, said this, um, I found it the most exhilarating thing I'd ever heard in my life, that uh, for some unknown reason that SAS soldiers had probably stopped the Israelis coming into the war. And no other reason than that. The guy who owned this AK-47 was trying to kill me with it. Now I own it, and he's dead. From 1970 to 1976, the British fought a secret war in Oman, a war that no one's ever heard of. In that war, many people died. Some were heroes. This film is about four of them. Oh, man. You're looking into a, a medieval world, a world that still chopped people's hands off for thieving. Women were stoned to death for adultery. The man, he was the head of the household. The woman was a mere chattel. It was a warrior race. You were looking at a society without hospitals, without medical aid, without roads. Currency was in camels. A society that was ripe for communist takeover. days, our main task was to support the Sultan's armed forces. Since the communist takeover of Aden in 1967, the communist regime, backed of course by Moscow, was supporting the rebels in Dofar with a direct armed supply line. If it had been allowed to carry on, they would have worked their way right up to the top of Muscat and they would have probably captured the Musandam Peninsula, which looks straight across at the Straits of Hormuz, which is one of the most tactical sea lanes in the world. They could have cut the world in half. It could have all led eventually to the Third World War if we hadn't controlled the region. There were nine of us. We were all seasoned soldiers, veterans. Most had served in Borneo, Aden. They were good, well-trained soldiers who were steady under fire. Fuzz, he liked a few drinks, did Fuzz. A man who wore Afghan jackets and beads. Fuzz always used to carry around with him a battery-operated tape recorder, and his favorite tape was the Easy Rider became a sort of an anthem. A very good mortar man, he would end up carrying the day in many respects. Mlaba, a man of immense physical courage, determination and humor, 
a man who never knew fear, a man who could carry enormous weights on his back all day long and still go out on the piss at night. A warrior. This man would save my life. Tak, his brother in arms, another Fijian who would carry on the fight even though seriously wounded. His back shot away, propped up. He would fire an SLR which has got a particularly aggressive kick. He would carry on firing that rifle even though he must have been in extreme physical pain. He wouldn't surrender. Tommy, first class medic, one of the boys, good to be with, a free faller, handsome guy. He didn't even get a medal for running up under fire and they never recognised him. Mike Keeley, his father won the DSO in the Second World War, young troop officer, brave, courageous, did his job on the occasion. The intelligence briefing we got was of a bunch of insurgents who would fight to the death. They knew all the latest guerrilla tactics. They had the full range of Soviet weapons and they had the supply route back up from Aden, a communist port. Remember, you must win the hearts and the minds of a population to win that sort of a battle scenario. Murbat itself was a, a seaside town. It always reminded me of a small Cornish fishing town, but not quite as organized. The place would stink of fish. There was rats in all the houses. The back streets were littered with rubbish. They didn't seem to have any organization as far as modern society is concerned, no collection of refuge. A backward nation in every sense. When we arrived there with modern medicines, it was like um, we were the messiahs. We could make people walk again just by injecting them with a few cc's of butazolidine. And uh, the actual bat medical center became like a focal point for the whole town. We were given a house by the, the Wali of Murba. It had a good flat roof where we could form a defensive position. We mounted a GPMG in the sustained fire roll on one corner of the building. We had a 5-0 Browning mounted on the other corner of the building. From this position, we had a good view of the Murbat plane, also a good view of the fort. The DG fort, which was uh, a Dofa John Darmory position, and we set up in the bat house, not knowing that it would lead to one of the decisive battles against communism that's been fought since Korea. We just about completed our five months tour, and we were handing over to another squad who's arrived the day before, and we were just going through with them the you know the type of job we were doing. You know, the morale is always very very high. Um, especially when you're looking forward to going home. Um, we've done um, five months and it's been quite a uh, hard five months. Uh, we, um, we were involved with the same squad at the time up in, uh, up in the hills. We had so many battles, you know, working together, working two squads at a time. People have seen actions, you know, um, almost every every day in the mountain. But as far as we are concerned, you know, we were all <clears throat> looking forward to going home. And this is our last night, and uh, we were due to go back to Salala, and from there we, we go back to UK. And everybody was all relaxed, and uh, nobody ever expected uh, anything like that to happen, especially when it's your, your last day. The night before the battle, we had a visit from the G Squadron rep. G Squadron were about to take over. We, B Squadron, 
had come to the end of our three-month tour. Some of the guys had gone to bed early, myself included. Labba, who liked to drop a run and, and fuzz, decided to uh, get stuck into G-Squadron's uh, issue of rum. We'd used ours up. You could hear the low hum of uh, stories from Borneo, because uh, Labba and Fuzz had both been in Borneo before. So I must have drifted off to sleep. My first recollections of the battle beginning must have been in the small hours. I could hear this thudding and a rumbling noise. Unbeknown to us, the night picket on Jebel Ali had already been taken out and up to the knife. first thing I saw was about 40 to 50 Adu. They suddenly began moving across our front, advancing at speed. It was obvious that the fort and the 25 pounder was their objective. If they'd taken that and turned it on us, it would have all been over. It was at this point that one of the old guys from the Ascaris in the Wallis fort must have decided enough is enough. How he pulled the trigger and opened fire. Labber had already run up to the to PG fort and was find the uh, 25 pounder. We could see the flash, we could see the movement, we could see all the activity around the base of the fort. We had radio contact with him on the Tokai and he was firing on registered targets. Very difficult when you think that's a three man gun crew, he was firing on it on his own. He's a garble message a bit later to say that he'd been chinned. At this point, that Tacknam made a personal decision that he would go and join his Fijian brother. And he just disappeared into the gloom. Caller saying that he's been chinned. What he meant was uh, he had a grace on his chin, either um, ricochet or, or a bullet. Between 300 and 400 yards up on a hill. I ran up dodging as much as I can, taking cover when I have to. advancing towards the fort, you know, the, the firing is getting heavier from all directions. Keely then tried to get in contact with Tak, who had taken the Tokai with him so that he could have an up-to-date situation report of what was going on around the gun pit. He couldn't get through to the tuck eye in the gun position, so he then had to make a personal decision to go and find out what was going on up there. Keying out for reinforcements. 
I finished the message and Mike Keeley just turned and said, uh, fire is in, which meant I had to get up on the fireball ground and cover him in. So the die was cast. I put down the headphone on the 316 and raced up the fireball ground and waited. I remember looking down and I could just see the pair of them slipping off to the right where there was a, a small wadi that ran up towards the DG fork and off they went, pepper potting forward, one man covering, one man firing. And then that was the last I saw them. Five pound is still firing, belching flame, there was smoke swirling everywhere. There was heavy machine gun fire hitting it. There was mortar rounds landing. The whole area was just a, a frenzy of activity. Lub and I knew at the time that we were almost surrounded. So Lub. Um, crawled away from the gun pit towards the mortar. I looked at Lava, he looked at me, and it's as if he knew something was going to happen. And I had this crack. And I turned and um, all I could see was a, a blood, um, a bullet hit his neck and the blood was pouring out and the lover died instantly within seconds. Toby Toby was the first one to, to come in over the sand. And as he was climbing over the sand, he got shot on the, on the jaw. And all I could see was his face being totally um, torn apart. The best sound that I ever heard was the, the screaming of, of, of jets, strike master, that came from the, the sea, bust us once, and did a circle and came in with a heavy armaments, firing you know, machine guns and uh, more or less right on top of us. And I believe the only thing that saved us at the time was the jets. The battle, in fact, was drawing to a close. We had quite a few successful air strikes and the Adu were in retreat. I didn't know at this stage of the game what the casualties were. We had lost comms earlier in the battle. Somebody had ordered up a Kazivak chopper and that flew past the bathhouse and landed up by the DG fort. I could see them loading bodies in. It then took off again, flew towards the bat house and landed near the, the, near the front door. I could clearly see from where I was up in the 5 Browning, the command post, I could clearly see the pilot with his arm waving, beckoning, so I thought I'd better go down and see what's going on. I ran down the stairs, out through the front door, and there he was still beckoning. I ran over to where the pilot was seated and he uh, shouted over the noise of the rotor blades. And he checked the bodies in the back. We believe one of them's yours. I peeled back the blanket on the first body and there was um, a dead Arab, gunshot wounds to the head in the middle and the dead Arab. And then I got to the, the top body, peeled back the blanket It was the uh, figure of a male laying face down, head laying on the crook of the arm. The features obscured. 
I attempted to turn the body over, but rigor mortis had set in. It was solid. I then had to lever the whole body up using the crook of the elbow. As I levered the body upwards, <clears throat> I could just see Labber's features. Now, <coughs> The, uh, the jawline, the jawline had been shot away, but I could tell, I could tell it was Labber by his eyes. They were still open. It was like a sledge, sledgehammer blow to the morale. I was still hyped up after the battle, but all feelings of exhilaration disappeared in a flash. Here was a man I drunk with, fought with, laughed with, and he was laid out on a stretcher, stiff as a board. It was just too much. I was engulfed with sorrow at the loss of such a comrade. If he hadn't carried on the fight, that position would probably have been overrun. And uh, who knows what would have happened then. He was given an MID because they claimed the war was secret and if they'd have given him a VC, the publicity, he would have been front page news back in UK and then everybody would have descended on Dofar just like they did in Vietnam with the Yanks and we would have suffered accordingly. So they gave him an MID you can get an MID for walking down the Falls Road in Northern Ireland. We were told when we got back that every man would get at least an MM. That never materialised. We were then told that uh, Takavizi would get the DCM. And that's fair enough. And then we were told that Mike Keeley got the DSO, just as his father had done in the Second World War. And then we heard that Tommy, who'd run up under fire to give medical aid and got shot in the process, would get nothing, not even an MID. I mean, that in itself is worth a VC. He got nothing. The rest, we just have our memories. I finally made the decision to go back in 1995 and uh, it was quite a shock as we made our way into the town itself. It all sort of, you know, 23 years just disappeared, you know, it was just... It's as though I'd never been away. And then I started to get this feeling of uh, elation again as we got into the town I thought yeah we did a good job that day look at it look at the progress look they've big housing estate now across the battlefield this place has been redeveloped we actually did a good job that day probably saved all the, the villagers from a untimely death and ourselves of course 
and there is real progress here. So I guess the guys didn't give their lives away for, for nothing. I think at the end of the day it was a job well done.